Let's do this. Hi, Sonia. Thanks for joining me on this third episode of my new podcast, Awareness in Motion. And let me introduce you to the audience. So Sonia Johansson is a movement educator. She began her formal training at the age of six and pursued a career in dance and theatre, hoping that the art could lead to life-changing experiences for an audience and change the way people think for the better. She soon realised that performance had limited outcomes but having been introduced to the Feldenkrais Method at college, recognise that helping people fine tune their proprioceptive sense and become aware of their habits was a more powerful tool for liberating and optimising the body and mind, regardless of age and experience or ability. And so now, 30 years on, you've been practising Feldenkrais and Pilates, and that's why I've uh, got you on the call today on the podcast. So would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? <laughs> well, thank you, Angela. It's great to be here. And I'm really excited by what you're doing. I think it's really important to offer um, uh, our audience, whoever that might be, people who are experienced in my work, your work, and to have the opportunity to hear um, people who are working day to day and the kinds of um, discoveries they're making because then they get to you know um, benefit from all those years of experience so I think that's great and congratulations um, what do I want to say about myself I think I was um, as a young woman girl growing up and I thought theatre was amazing and I thought that expression and creativity could lead to kind of cathartic changes in both the audience, you know, the individuals and, and uh, to society at large. And then I was like out in the world as an actor and realised, oh, that's not going to happen. So I'm actually quite pleased that I was introduced to Feldenkrais because as I was sort of in the midst of my career as a performer is going, you know, this is not as satisfying, but I remember something really transformational and that was the Feldenkrais method. So I came back to it and became a practitioner. Yeah. So similar to my own journey, I was introduced mm. to Feldenkrais just after my dance training. And, you know, you're also Australian as well. So we've got similar paths, haven't we? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so before we get into the questions, do you have a short, concise definition of the Feldenkrais method? For those what you're going to ask. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, of course. You, you have to ask that question, don't you? Yeah. So... It, it always depends on who I'm speaking to. But if I have to give a generic kind of description, I say the Feldenkrais method helps you perform at your peak. Um, it's an innovative system of neuromuscular retraining that improves balance, coordination, range of motion, efficiency and performance. And I just like to say that it um, helps you basically, you don't learn something extra you basically reconnect your natural abilities and those abilities around thinking and sensing, um, moving and feeling. And, and by refi refining, tuning and honing into your own proprioception, um, it helps you master your own behaviour. So behaviour could be movement, could be posture. Um, it could be, you know, dealing with um, a habit or a compulsion. So it could be an emotional, um, you know, less visible to someone who's watching you. Yeah. So that's it. perfect. Awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not really concise, is it? <laughs> Any questions about that? Uh, post in the comments if you're not sure what we're talking about <laughs> but you'll discover more as you listen to this podcast and our conversation mm. today and so do you have a definition of Pilates or would you like to get straight into talking about the com the similarities or uh, yeah. complementary way they can work together well I know I shouldn't be doing this but I went to Wikipedia and I I, I want to see the definition. I don't always trust Wikipedia, but it's somewhere to start, isn't it? So yeah. I'm going to read it to you. Um, Pilates is a conditioning routine that may help build flexibility, muscle strength and endurance in the legs, abdominals, arms, hips and back. It puts emphasis on spinal and 
and pelvic alignment of breathing and developing a strong core or center and improving coordination and balance. Hmm, beginning to sound quite similar, isn't it? Yes. So um, I think there is very, how can I say it, very little crossover between our work. Um, but I think they can actually live together in the same person. And as I've discovered, I've, I've been doing this for about 10 years, I've created a fusion. So I actually, in the course of one hour, they live together. Yeah. These two, you know, Feldenkrais is really about principles. Mm. Although we have thousands, well, a thousand lessons that have been transcribed from Moshe, and I don't know how many exercises Joseph Pilates. And of course, so these two practices, this is what they have in common. They both have, a, 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 the originator was um, a white Germanic man who was persecuted and had to leave their homeland. And one of them, I think, I mean, they were both really interested in helping people and helping people feel physically more assured. I think that's definitely the case. Yeah. As I understand Joseph Pilates, he, he, quite, he became obsessed by a particular anatomy book as a young man and became a bodybuilder. Yeah. And if you know anything about Moshe Feldenkrais, um, he was very active. And Moshe Feldenkrais is quite different because he was a scientist. And... We like to think of him as a polymath because he was not only expert in his field of engineering and physics, but he was a, a martial artist and he had quite yeah. a prestigious circle of friends. So yeah. we can talk about that because it wasn't just mates that he drank with. No, These I... were people like Margaret Mead and Wilhelm Reich. They were, they were extraordinary people that were changing the way society thought. So he synthesized a lot of that. So not for a moment undermining Pilates, but it's exercise. Let's kind of, you know, yeah. say that. It, it is, it's an exercise form. It's a very powerful one, which is why I do it. Personally, I do it. I don't want to, you know, I do Pilates yeah. because I'm an, you know, I'm 50 and I've got a lot of injuries from being a dancer. So, um, but Feldenkrais is what keeps me agile. Feldenkrais is what keeps me um, trying new things, you know, yep. in the last five years. I've been doing martial arts, which is a really challenging form of martial arts. It's free form. It's not... Yeah. It, so, yeah. So, we're getting a little off topic. So, I'll let you rein me in anytime you like. Okay. Pull it in. So, we've talked a little bit about Pilates journey, Feldenkrais journey, what about this idea we're chatting before about conventional Pilates versus more informed Pilates? Because we want the buyer to be aware of the differences in the teachers that are out there and the practitioners of particularly Pilates. Yeah, I, I think this is a really important discussion. And it's not just about Pilates. It's really about everything you know mm -hmm. where does your food come from um where yeah. do you send your kids to school what kind of what kind of news program are you watching you know buyer beware how are they what's their um, motivation maybe but the interesting thing is i, I was doing my it's sort of like a comparison list pilates yeah. and the feldenkrais method and um it was basically when it comes to finding a feldenkrais teacher of course, it's great if they've got a lot of experience and they have exposure to other modalities, but you can't really hurt yourself in a Feldenkrais lesson because inherently built in is that you are being asked to sense yourself and use that as a guide. Yes. In a Pilates class, however, the experience and the knowledge base of your teacher is essential. I have been in too many Pilates classes where my teacher looked phenomenal, usually a young woman. And this is not just an assumption from having been in the class, because I like to go to other people's classes, but having had a conversation with that teacher and recognising they had about this much knowledge of anatomy mm. because their certification was three days. And they're just really good at Pilates and they've been doing it a long time. <laughs> so, you know, we really have to question and... Um, 
that leads me to another conversation I had with someone earlier is like no other industry, the exercise fitness world is so under-regulated. Yep. And the dance and the dance world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that Feldenkrais doesn't fit into the, it's not actually in that realm. So that's why I say it's, it's generally safe for most people mm. and yeah, Pilates is actually not safe for a lot of people. Mm. And especially in the conventional way it's being taught. Uh, again, a lot of my colleagues here in New York, when I'm in New York, um, are fabulous, amazing Feldon, sorry, Pilates instructors. Yeah. And they tell me about their teacher because they're around my age and they didn't work directly with um, Joseph Pilates. Joseph Pilates died in 1967. Moshe Feldenkrais died in 1984. So they were around about the same era. Yeah. But um, the better teachers inform themselves with current up-to-date science when it comes to anatomy and kinesiology. And they recognize the variety in the work. So I know a lot of people who love Pilates, but their routine, the, the, the program they do is exactly the same. Mm. Um, and they do that, it's almost like they walk in the room and the teacher basically could play a record. Kids, do you know what that is? <laughs> it means there's no variation. It's the same thing every time. Apparently, Joseph Pilates never taught like that. Apparently, when he taught, it was initially on apparatus. So there's a similarity a little bit with Feldenkrais and Pilates is that he started, he basically, he was in an internment camp because he was German and he was living in the US and they thought a bit suspicious, so they thought they'd lock him up, you know. And he was allowed to work with the, um, the, the patients. I think there was a hospital there. So he undid the springs on an old fashioned bed and he had them using that as resistance. So people were lying down, so they were pretty safe. And um, so a lot of his work originated from his apparatus. So there's Cadillac and the chair and of course the reformer that most people who done some fellow I'm sorry. See I can't stop saying those two words interchangeably. But um, Matt Matt work came much later. Mm. And Joseph Pilates apparently never taught the same person the same routine twice. That's what I've heard now. These are things that might be legend. And is there any way of fact-checking? I don't know. But Moshe Feldenkrais was a little bit the same. He started working one-on-one -on -one with people. So he was actually using his hands. So it was considered a manual therapy. And each person, well, people would come to him of all ages and abilities. He mm. was famously known to work with infants and children who were nonverbal, partly because of developmental or brain injury and partly because they were just too young. Mm. And then working with very skilled people, um, you know, some yeah. quite well-known athletes and, and performers of the time. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's very interesting how it's developed into this structured exercise routine by the conventional Pilates method. And yeah. Not, and not a method where you know, the student, it's student led. Mm -hmm. um, as mm -hmm. in, and I know there's similarities with yoga as well. There's the two streams in yoga. We're not going to go into that today. We can save that for someone else's talk. So your ideas around core work and definition mm. of core, since that seems to be the theme of Pilates and why a lot of people go to Pilates, I need a stronger core. My doctors told me try Pilates. My physio said, try Pilates, get a stronger core to help your lower back pain. Let's dive into this huge topic. <laughs> it is huge because I like to say that core is the four letter C word. And if you're in my class, I won't let you say it because it's sort of like saying air or water. It's like, well, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. So, it, well, you know, in the, the most limited definition of core I've heard from, you know, Pilates instructors is uh, one particular muscle. It's called the transversus abdominis. It's a really interesting muscle because it, um, although it attaches to bone, like most skeletal muscles do, it doesn't actually create joint action. Right. So if you, okay. if you <coughs> clear your throat and you stay tall, a lot of that, of course, is your diaphragm 
but um, it will be your belt muscle, which is the muscle that goes sort of wraps around your belt area or your um, girdle, if you know what that is. Um, and then I've heard it, it going in the other direction, but it's basically everything from, if you're wearing short sleeves from there through your torso down to your knees, like every muscle. I was like, well, oh. every muscle? <laughs> yeah. So um, it's really vague. But if I'm at a party or I'm meeting someone for the first time in a sort of casual setting and I, I say, oh, yeah, I teach Pilates. What do you think the first thing that person does after pull hearing you say that? <laughs> they pull their belly in. And you know what? Stand taller. They lose, a, they lose one inch. They don't stand taller. Oh. So if you're listening to this talk and you're sitting down, just plant your feet for a moment and just be really relaxed and a bit, a bit lazy, a bit loose in your body. And then pull your belly in. Bring your belly button towards your spine in the back. You just lost about a quarter of an inch or an, a centimetre of height because what you actually did is tipped your pelvis into a backward direction. So this gets a bit tricky. I have lots of ideas about... So I suppose when I say Pilates, if I say I'm going to add a Pilates principle, precepts, that's a better word is that I'm really talking about um, pelvic lumbar stabilisation. Yep. But actually I mean mobilisation because that's how I come about creating my class is that I will always start with mobilising before stabilising because if you, are, you arrive in your Pilates class and you've just been um, contorted sitting in your car or maybe sitting at your desk for hours or days and days and then you launch straight into your Pilates class or you've you've been on your phone or carrying your purse over your shoulder your handbag you're just going to make a stronger version of that mm. so firstly you have to um, undo all of that and then you have to sense yourself very clearly accurately and honestly and that's where i think the feldenkrais work can really inform anyone's pilates practice whether you're going to do my work or not and um i love uh, that i love that analogy because i talk often about you know we are sitting all the time we've become chair shaped and just launching straight into a fitness routine isn't going to change that no so i love that um thank you what are you about to say <laughs> Oh, well, I love that phrase. You did a, a lovely posting about we've all become chair shaped and we have <laughs> because um, th there's, a, there's a, a predominance in the conventional Pilates and I'm careful about saying that because like I say, I've met some astonishingly insightful, perceptive Pilates teachers that they can not only work one-on-one -on -one with a person and help them resolve a huge amount of postural and movement issues, but they can do that in the setting of a, of a room. And that's pretty remarkable. I think for Feldenkrais, that's what we're doing. We're trying to look at each individual and teach them at the level that they're at. So one of the problems is, you know, I had a, I don't know if I want to, can I, do I dare pull up a slide Shall I try it? Try it. Um, oh, try I'll try it. But, you know, of course, it's, it's going to go horribly wrong. But, you know, I, I want to be... Technology is teaching me so... Angela's teaching me so many things and not to be afraid of technology. So it's like, oh, well, let's just give it a go and see what happens. And so I'm going to pull up something I just got off, quite frankly, Amazon. And they, they're kind of... There are either, you know, a couple of bucks to buy or they're completely free. And it's a Pilates chart and it shows you, I don't know, I think there's 30 exercises. So let me, can you see that? Yeah, the general now, outline, yes. Yeah, and, and I, I could zoom in, but I don't want to because I want to say the top half of that chart, that person, or of course it's a figure, is doing movements that take their spine into flexion. Yeah. Flexion is when the front of your body is short and the back of your body is long. And flexion has a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if I should go back, but a number of those movements were done in sitting. And the problem with being flexed while you're seated is that it puts an enormous amount of strain on your intervertebral discs. 
Now, if you're 25, that's no big deal. If you're 35, it becomes somewhat worrisome. 45, you're running into problems because those discs are spaces between one vertebra and the next. And it's yeah. not that the discs themselves are so important, but what they do is they provide that space so that the um, spinal cord and all the exiting nerves have the right amount of room. Yeah. So um, th those are some of the dangers of basically Pilates, which is if you have disc problems or you want to avoid them, you have to choose your Pilates instructor very carefully. Yes. Yeah. So it's interesting that, you know, we have the physios and the doctors telling us to go to Pilates and yet are they vetting who they're sending them to? Um, yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So you love fusing the Feldenkrais method and Pilates. How do you go about designing your classes? <laughs> I find it I fascinating, think, this, what you've told me already in the, the short. Yeah, well, I have to tell you why I decided to fuse them or, or why I thought, oh, you know, Feldenkrais has really informed everything about the way I think and move. Mm. And then I realised there was something missing. Uh, there were a couple of things missing. If you, if you, Studying Feldenkrais, uh, classical Feldenkrais, or even um, it, you can become a little bit too loosey goosey. Mm. You can become a little overly relaxed, which doesn't sound like a bad thing in current times. But what that means is that you become a little bit um, uh, undertoned. I don't mean not skinny, I mean that your muscles are a little bit less likely to engage and stabilise. And as you get older, one of the ways to protect against arthritic pain, not arthritis itself, but maybe arthritis, is to stabilise the joints more, knees, hips, spine. So what I recognise that a lot of my Feldenkrais clients who were coming to me because they had either orthopaedic issues, they had underlying um, kind of undiagnosed pain problems and they were slowly coming out of that as we worked together is that the next stage along their learning is they needed to learn to exert and engage their musculature system in an efficient way and that's where Pilates I thought oh this stuff's quite good actually and I've been doing it for myself I have a couple of herniated discs for other reasons so um that's how I thought, well, let's, let's go to that practice because I realised with yoga, I've got a half a dozen yoga injuries and that was about stretching all the teachers I had been to. And I realised that's also a conventional, modern, contemporary interpretation of yep. yoga. So um, the, the idea of creating a, 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 a neutral spine and neutral just sounds like a vanilla word neutral what is that it's like in the middle it's nothing it's meh but neutral is a bit like the way Moshe Feldenkrais described ideal posture and he described ideal posture not by showing a photograph or telling you the angle of this body part and that body part he says it's the, the I'm going to paraphrase it and that's one of my great skills yes. paraphrasing um, to a, a position from which you can move in any direction with equal ease, with little to no preparation. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you just mull over that. You just, if you're slumped in your chair and you leaned over here, even to get up, I have to come over to this direction. I have to go from the back space to the forward space. So neutral um, comes into play in Pilates because a lot of the conventional style had you go into a backward tip, which meant that your pelvis was rocked back onto the sit bone and the lower back arch had disappeared and you had lost height and you were putting pressure on your disc. So my goal, because I also work, um, a lot of my clients, I don't know what percentage, are kind of women my age and a little older. So women who are menopausal or postmenopausal and bone density is becoming a real concern. And the pharmaceutical industry is, is desperately trying to encourage us all to take this or that drug. And it's inconclusive whether it really does help. Mm -hmm. So um, the other reason that neutral or lengthened spine is so important is if you flex, 
you're going to be loading the vertebral bodies, which are the bony element segments. And if you do have bone density concerns, you're going to be in danger of compressing or collapsing those vertebra, which you don't want to do either. So I call all of my Pilates, any Pilates I teach is osteoporosis safe. And I'm again, quite surprised when I go to someone else's class and I see that most of the room are women my age and older, and I'm kind of horrified what the teacher is inviting them to do. Yeah. Mm, it's scary. <laughs> Lucky we're out here. Um, spreading the good word of what is possible for women and for anyone really. So mm. one thing that I haven't mentioned yet is we've actually been working together. You're one of my online marketing students and we're working towards delivering a special um, program in the coming weeks. So I want to ask you, what are you most excited about for your business moving forward online, especially? Well, I think we've all, in one way or another, just had to embrace technology. I mean, unless you live in a beautiful forest in a cabin somewhere with fresh running water and, you know, whatever. Uh, we're just having to realise that the world is coming to us through our computer. And I've, you know, embraced that over the last five months. And I teach about oh, 12 classes a week. I'm actually away from home at the moment and what I've um, begun to do is create a kind of cache of recorded material. So that's gonna be a part of my um, offer to sample these short, um, full-bodied, integrated, sensory-informed um, exercise and there's a lot of influence from my influence is obviously Feldenkrais mm -hmm. so that's the sensory element recognizing that your proprioception is a skill you, you have it so um, an artist doesn't go out and work on their eyes they don't stare at things and and you know um, a sommelier you know someone who's a, a wine um, uh, expert yes. doesn't you know work on their tongue so we have this idea that proprioception is something that you have to go out and do it's actually with you all the time it's just that as you know adults we sit and we tune out we become a little bit above the neck oriented yeah and that gets us into a lot of trouble i mean i know that you've got some you've got two boys and i think the youngest is probably still at that age where he just wriggles and fidgets oh yeah and it's <laughs> such an important uh, way of taking care of the body because as soon as we learn that um, discipline mm -hmm. of sitting still we get into a lot of trouble so actually that's one of the things i've learned in these interviews is just sit still just stop fidgeting and then at the end of the, the interview i have to go and lie on the floor and roll around oh, yeah. or articulate my spine or something like that yeah, it's yeah so that's just yesterday we we're um watching a movie and he's laying on the floor and i'm like why am i laying down on the floor with him so i got on the why floor. not your home <laughs> your floor lie down I truly believe you know, all kids you just got to run them so we went out yesterday and went to the beach and how to play around so yeah it's so important for everybody <laughs> yeah we forget that we're like oh kids need it. it's like uh adults really need it <laughs> Because yep. um, that's, that's really why I do what I do because I'm fighting those external forces of gravity and time, mm. aging. Mm. And, um, you know, you either address it, honestly, or you suffer the consequences. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So have you got a little sample available for everybody now that we can post below the video? <laughs> I definitely do. So I have a... a Pretty simple. It's about 15 minutes and it is the fusion of Feldenkrais Pilates with a foam roller. Now, um, foam rolling is quite the trend. People do a lot of breaking up of tight muscles and apparently they're hydrating fascia and all sorts of interesting ideas. Whether they're true or not, I don't know. But um, apparently Moshe Feldenkrais was the first person to use rollers in a therapeutic movement setting. So we believe he was probably using them, I don't know, around the 1950s. So that means, you know, how many years is that? 70 years ago. Um, so 
Yeah, he used them as a way of um, basically destabilizing the client. Oh. So when we sit or we lie close to the ground, we can't really fall because we're as close as we can get. But um, quite a well-known story is that Moshe Feldenkrais living in Israel at the time worked with a very well-known musician named Yehudi Menuhin who was elderly and had a few physical ailments going on. And Moshe Feldenkrais had these two rollers. At the time, they weren't made of foam. They were made of, I think, cardboard or wood, about yay big in diameter, and I'm not sure how long they were. But over the course of many lessons, he actually taught Mr. Menuhin, Yehudi, to be able to stand on them so that they were this way and his feet were on them. And then he handed him his violin. And who he played his violin. So, of course, what he had to learn to do is to um, uh, inhibit all the unnecessary engagement, which is actually what I'm trying to do in my Pilates class. Yes. Is if it's not serving you in the action that we're trying to do, don't do it. It's like trying to carry two eggs, and then someone says, "Oh, that's great. You've got two eggs, but here's another ten. <laughs> Can you carry them to the other side of the yard for me? You're going to get into trouble." So being very specific without actually naming muscles, which I don't ever do. Yes, so that's another that, big difference. So we'll link that below the video and so people can get a taste of what it's like to um, experience this Feldenkrais and Pilates fusion. Is there anything else you'd like to finish off um, saying before we wrap this up? <laughs> no, I think there's so much we can talk about. And, and of course, if we had, you know, some viewers, they would set, certainly tell them that, tell us their experience. But, um, yeah, I think whatever you do, like I was saying, whether it's the food you eat, the, the information you consume or the movement class you go to, really um, question. Don't let the teacher tell you what you should feel. Whenever you hear that, it's like someone telling you the thoughts you should be having. Um, you should really question whether you're in the right room. And the more the teacher actually help, allows you to modify what you're doing, I think you're in the right space and yeah. probably will be able to make those better and better choices. Yeah. I think the whole world, given the current environment, is questioning a lot of what they're experiencing and hearing and seeing and especially with yeah everything going on so hopefully they can take that into their movement practice and into everything that they're um going about doing in the world uh thanks for being on the podcast and i do want to mm -hmm. mention anyone watching post in the comments we can come back and answer your questions we will be having another interview um when uh sonia has her offer ready so we can talk specifically about that mm -hmm. and um enjoy the rest of your day <laughs> evening for you great yeah. day for me <laughs> dark outside yeah <laughs> thanks so much angela thank you it's been fun it has all right bye everybody <laughs> <laughs>